There's a new 13th age coming out next year. I'm going to spotlight a really excellent YouTube video that I watched this past week from a fellow YouTube creator. I want to talk about the opportunity for a new standard array for the ability scores for the 5th edition of D&D. I'm going to do a spotlight of the Dungeons of Drakenheim product by the Dungeon Dudes and Ghostfire Gaming. And we're going to go over some questions from the August 2022 set of Patreon questions, all today on the Lazy D&D Talk Show. I'm Mike Shea, your pal from Sly Flourish, here to talk about all things D&D. This show is brought to you by the patrons of Sly Flourish. If you want to get access to all kinds of exclusive material and an exclusive access to a Discord channel and previews of upcoming events, you can help support shows like this by becoming a patron of Sly Flourish. The link to becoming a patron is in the show notes below and to the patrons of Sly Flourish. Thank you so much for your outstanding support. So Gen Con was this past week. I guess it was last weekend and there's a bunch of different announcements that kind of happened at Gen Con, but a few of them caught my eye. One of them that caught my eye is is that Rob Hainso is going to be putting out a new version, a new update to 13th Age. I have done a preview of 13th Age before. If you want to see that, there's a link to the preview of the spotlight that I did on 13th Age before. I love 13th Age. I think it is a wonderful RPG setting. I think it's a wonderful RPG. I ran a campaign. I think I've run a couple of campaigns in 13th Age. It came out right around the time between 4th and 5th edition of D&D. And what I really liked about it is it captured a lot of the super high power, high fantasy of 4th edition D&D, but in a much more straightforward and palatable way in a lot of ways. It also really gave me a good understanding of what abstract combat can be like. And I really loved it. It's a fascinating RPG. I really enjoyed it. If you're a big fan of, of 4E, if you're a big fan of 4th edition, I'd suggest taking a good look at 13th Age because it's just an excellent RPG that I think captures a lot of it. It is designed by both a designer of 4th edition D&D and a designer of 3rd edition of D&D who partnered together to work on it. And I'm very excited to see that there's going to be a Kickstarter for this coming out next year where they're going to do the 13th Age Escalation Edition. So that is, that is that's a, a really cool... I'm 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 very excited about that. There was I think this got announced because there was basically a handout and it talked about some of the things. This is an article from NWorld. You can find this link in the show notes. 13th Age Escalation Edition on Kickstarter 2023. Backward compatible with 10 years of supported books. There's lots of stuff for 13th Age. I've actually written a bunch of stuff for 13th Age. I, I've worked with Rob Hainso and, and, and some of I have some monsters and things like that in their books. Better options for class talents, powers and spells. That sounds interesting. Improved icon relationships. That was actually the icon relationships was one of the trickier bits of 13th Age. So I'm, I'm glad that they're going to take sort of another look at how how the icon relationships work scarier monsters and cooler treasures cool more banter better advice i like that too that's something about 13th age i really liked is that there are sidebars it's a very personal rpg there are sidebars all over the place that describe the personal drives and 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 directions and thoughts of the individual designers of the game which is something i really like new and better take on the fighter i don't know everybody's got a gun out for the fighter but okay each class gets two additional pages of new talents, feats, powers, and spells. Seems like they already have a pretty good idea where they're going with this, so it'll be interesting. And a new cover from Lee Moyer and Aaron McConnell, so we get a new cover. So that's really cool. The idea that it's fully backward compatible, that's really nice, and I'd like to see the improvement. So I'm all over this. I will absolutely back this. I love 13th Age. Again, I think even the current version of 13th Age is worth trying, worth paying for worth picking up it's really really good i've got piles of 13th age stuff all over the place my players really love 13th age it's very high power DD. if you're looking for DD, but you really want to watch the power of it scale up a lot more and capture a lot of that idea of richer richer characters that have lots of powers to them check out check out 13th age and i will definitely be keeping an eye out for this next year i watch a lot of different youtube videos for DD stuff a lot of times to just kind of see what people are talking about. And this past week, one particular video caught my attention and I watched it. And I was like, that is such a great video. Like I, it, it's short and it's direct and it talks about interesting things and it offers really practical advice. I was passing it around to friends of mine. And I said, I want to talk about it on the show. And that video is by Zipper on Disney. It's an, a video by Zipper on Disney with the title of $20 for everything you need to run the dragons of, to run dragons of Stormwreck Isle. And what he does in this video, seven minute, seven minute YouTube video. And what he does in this video is he is a craft video. It's about how to make all of the kinds of things that you would run to, to run this game for 20 bucks. So he goes to dollar stores. He goes to craft stores. He goes to, to Target. It's a very funny video. And he picks up things like glass beads and a lot of paint and a lot of other craft accessories. He picks it up for under $20 and then makes like battle maps and tokens and handouts and all kinds of things. And he covers so much stuff 
in this video. He talks about all the things that he's going to buy, and then he goes through the process. And what I what I really found exciting and interesting is he suggests picking up old wrapping paper because a lot of times on the back of wrapping paper there's a grid. Maybe sometimes there isn't a grid, and if there isn't a grid, guess what? You can still use it. You can you can just not have a grid. It's okay. It'll work. It'll work. It'll be okay. To not have a grid. Just make it that size and tell people they can move where they want. It'll be fine. But if it has a grid, that works too. So he draws, he shows about how you can draw maps on wrapping paper because he can pick it up for like a dollar. Crappy rolls of wrapping paper for like a dollar and you can you can make a whole lot. He talks about what I, and, and he does really, really good looking maps, right? Shows how to make the maps. He, he talks about what I found fascinating is the way that he does these beads so he takes glass beads he takes some black paint and he draws a symbol on it. he shows very straightforward icons for these symbols an eye or a sword or a little batman symbol or like a little he shows like a beast claw right he draws this little like you know this little very very simple beast claw right just four dots and a little paw and then he takes, this is what I found fascinating. He takes clear nail polish and he n does some clear nail polish on the back side of the bead. Remember, this is on the flat side. So you have the round side and the other side, you have the flat side. And he, he does a, a clear nail polish over the side. And then he lets that dry. And then he puts paint. He, he got some cheap, cheap paint, right? That apple, apple acrylic paint. And he paints right over that same side, right over the acrylic seal. And then when he turns them, look what they look what they turn into, right? He you then flip it over, and the image is reflected on the inside of the glass bead on the other side, and it just makes them look really, really good for you know not a lot of work. So I just found that look beautiful. These these things are these these are Etsy quality products. You could go sell these, right? You could probably sell them for way more than you paid for the dollar. Really, really cool. And he did it with both small ones and big ones. And I, I just, I really, so that, that in particular grabbed my attention, but then he shows about how to make like bits of terrain, like, you know, water, this is all just cardboard and wooden sticks. You can use it to make walls for dungeons. You can use it to do this other thing. So I just found this video and then he shows handouts, like how to make handouts for it. And so it's clearly like under $20, but the labor is a lot more than $20 worth of labor to make this stuff. But Boy, in a single seven minute video, he covers so much stuff about how to craft really good accessories. And it fits this idea that like, you don't need a lot of money to love this hobby. You don't need a lot of money to make really cool things for this hobby that, you know, some index cards and a Sharpie get you really, really far. So I just, I love this video. So this past couple of weeks, we've been starting a new, my, my Wednesday game has been switching over to run Empire of the Ghouls. And because we're running Empire of the Ghouls and we're using a lot of different class features, a lot of different character features from Cobalt Press products, including Tome of Heroes and Midgard Heroes, we're using paper character sheets and we're doing stuff like that. And one of the things that happened, one of the players that I've been playing with for a, a while now, he's he was still confused by how the hell attributes work. And it makes sense because like it is a, you know, he's a software engineer. He's a smart dude, but it's still like, you know, I looked and he's like, oh, you got a lot of odds. You never want to have an odd. And it's like, why not? I'm like, because the odds don't, you know, you, you don't get bonuses on evens and the bonuses are the only thing that matter. And he's like, well, why do they have this score? And I realized like how dorked up, I mean, I knew this and I'm like, you know, a lot of people have already known this, like how dorked up ability scores are in D D. the reason we have ability scores and not just flat bonuses is because of the legacy of D. &D. this goes back 50 years where we always had scores right three to 18 you roll 3d6 and you choose your attribute or now it's like 46 and you pick one and all that but the reality is very rarely does the score matter at all it's in very few circumstances do you ever look at the score instead you always look at the bonus and the bonus only happens on even numbers so you have that and then you have systems like point by which I propose. I'm not a big into rolling the dice because I don't want one character to be significantly better than the other or have a character who rolled the dice and then feels like they don't, like their character is underwhelming and now they have to stick with these terrible scores they got. So I much prefer to use point by where all the characters are roughly equal. The players can decide what they want to do and where they want to put it. And I recommend a standard array because it's pretty straightforward and easy to use. But the problem that you have is the point by system has this weird archaics. If you're trying to do like point by by hand, if you're not using an online tool, you have this weird thing about like, 
Well, different levels cost a different number of points, and you can't really get more than a certain amount. And so you're going to do it. And then you put racial ability bonuses on top of that. And then there's this thing where, like, if you, because the racial abilities are plus two, plus one, but they're not based on point buy, it's much more efficient to put a racial ability bonus on a high point buy one because you don't have to pay for that point buy cost. Oh my God. Oh my God, is this so complicated? And now that I'm using things like Tasha's rules, where you can apply those racial ability bonuses to any abilities, you don't have to tie them directly to the ones that you don't have to tie them to a specific one for a racial one. Well, now you have this weird thing of like, well, I can put my, my points wherever I want to put them, but they don't count towards point by. And it was just like such a hassle. And I'm like, can't we just come up with a new standard array? Can't we come up with a standard array that already includes the racial bonuses? And I thought, why not? Let's. What if we were to come up with a new standard array? And I, I wrote an article for Sly Flourish. It'll probably be out in a few weeks. But I wanted to bring it up on the show because I wanted to think about it more. And this show helps me think about stuff. So I thought of two different potential standard arrays. And I think I've narrowed it down to, to which one I like, which is this first one here. And the idea is when you pick a character, and, and you could do this for your session zero. During your session zero, you could say, we use a point by base system. And you can use Tasha's rules to apply either a plus two to one attribute and a plus one to another or a plus three to three different ones, your choice. Or if you just want to go with the easy mode, here is a standard array you can choose. And the standard array is 16, 14, 14, 12, 12, 8. 16, 14, 14, 12, 12, 8. So that gives you a plus three, plus two, plus two, plus one, plus one, and minus one. You pick one attribute you're really good at, you pick one attribute you're really bad at, and then you spread the other ones to the other four. Which ones are you pretty good at with plus twos? Which ones are you, you know, better at? You know, you're still above average. You know, you have great, good, above average, and and below average. And you pick those. And the nice thing is, like, you don't have to worry about where you're assigning points. You don't have to worry about where you're going to apply your plus two, plus ones. That this works pretty well. 16, 14, 14, 12, 12, 8. It's a nice standard array. It's all even. It, if you if you go through with the point by system, if you're, if you're choosing any general race other than, like, the variant human who gets plus one to everything, then you have plus one. You have this. If you have somebody who says, I really want to play the variant human, you say, okay that eight turns into a 10, right? You can just up the eight. Now, there's lots of reasons why you might not want to use this standard array. If you're doing multi-classing, you don't necessarily want the standard array because the multi-classing requirements are based on odd numbers, not even numbers. If you have a feat that you want to pick up that gives you plus one to one ability score, you want to make sure that that feat fits well with an ability score. You don't want to waste it by applying it to one that isn't even because again, you're back to an odd. If you're thinking about this that hard, it's not for you. If you're already thinking about multi-classing, if you're already thinking about feats where you have a plus one bonus, this standard array is not for you. This standard array is for people who just want to write down their attributes and get started with the game. It's particularly for new players who won't understand multi-classing, who won't understand feats with plus one bonuses. This is for just starting out. And if you're just starting out, starting by saying 16, 14, 14, 12, 12, 8 are your abilities, assign them where you want, and then you're ready to go. I think can be way easier. And we ended up with, with my friend when we were working through his new character. We said, just, I think this will work better. Just 16, 14, 14, 12, 12, 8, and you're, and you're all set. Now, you, there's an alternative, of course. There are other alternative sort of optimized point buy systems. I don't know that they're necessarily that much better than this. You could, for example, I think have like 16, 16, 12, 12, 10, 10. If you want to have two that you're really good at, two that you're okay at, and then two that you're average at, I think you could do 16, 16, 12, 12, 10, 10. The other one is if you really don't want a min a, an eight in anything, you don't want a minus one, you could do 16, 14, 14, 12, 10, 10. You have two that you're average at, two that you're above average, or one that you're above average at, two really good, and then and then your your top attribute. So my, my thought is just having a, having a simple one because like there is the standard array in the player's handbook. The problem with the standard array in the player's handbook is it doesn't apply your racial bonuses and it has three odd, I think it has two odd numbers, 15, 14, 13, 12, 10, 8. So that one has two odds, which means you're always going to have one odd number. You can still get pretty far with the standard array and a plus two plus one, but you're always going to have an odd number. And if you just do a little bit of point by optimization, you can get rid of your odds and you can have 16, 14, 14, 12, 12, 8, which is really a pretty good spread like that is a good set of attributes right you've got plus three plus two plus two plus one plus one and minus one you're only bad at one thing and you're above average in all other five stats that's pretty good so I wanted to share that. I wanted to get that. I get this idea. If you have thoughts about the standard array, if yours is going to be about how my super crazy build won't work well with that standard array, that's not what I'm looking for. What I'm looking for is, does this make sense for, for new players or players that just want to get their attributes down and get on with the game and not worrying about things like 
multi-classing, not worrying about things like feats where you have a plus one bonus that you would apply later. Because if you're worried about that, you can just go do the point by system. And even if you're in the middle of the game and you've already chosen this as your starting one, you know, a reasonable DM will let you change your abilities around if you're going to go and get a new feat that's got a plus one bonus. I never have a problem with characters changing their ability bonuses around. I think the Adventures League now lets you do it, where you can change your ability scores around. I wouldn't, I would be bothered if you change your ability scores around because you picked up like a gauntlets of ogre power and suddenly your 17 strength turned into an eight strength because you'd have a 19 strength because of the gauntlets. I that that's that's a little bit too far. But if you are if you want to move your attributes around so that you can get the value out of a plus one ability bonus from a feat that you picked, I would never have a problem with that. Would, basically, you'd probably be able to knock that eight up to a 10, or I don't think you could get another 14 out of it. You know, even if you're manipulating the point by system to add one extra point, I don't think that that matters. But generally what I'm thinking is this is just the easy mode. This is about ease. And it's, it's, is it optimal? It's not perfectly optimal, but it's pretty good. 16, 14, 14, 12, 12, 8. Those are pretty good ability bonuses. Like you're not gonna, if you're rolling, I don't think you get you get rolls that are that good pretty often. So I think I think that it can it can work well. So I'm curious about people's thoughts. Dungeons of Drakenheim is a campaign adventure written by the Dungeon Dudes on YouTube. They ran this as part of an ongoing live play streaming game that they did, and they partnered with Ghostfire Games, it, probably one of the biggest powerhouse third-party developers of 5th edition D&D products. Ghostfire Games is huge. They do massive Kickstarters for things. I've got, I've got a bunch of friends that work for Ghostfire Games, and they really put out fantastic products. So last year, they had a Kickstarter for Dungeons of Drakenheim. The Dungeons of Drakenheim Kickstarter made one point, almost $1.3 million on the Kickstarter, had 13,000 people backed it. I'm not really bringing a lot of attention to them that they don't already have. But I was one of the ones who backed it. I backed it for the physical version. I got both the physical, the physical book, I got the cloth map, and I got the PDFs and everything around it. And didn't really think about it until it showed back up on my desk later. I did not watch the streaming video. I have seen Dungeon, the Dungeon Dudes video, their, their YouTube channel from time to time. But I didn't pay a lot of attention to it. I knew it had gotten a lot of attention. I backed it to see what it was like. And I got it. And I started giving it a good look. I mean, I've given it like a little look here and there, kind of flipping through it to see it. And then yesterday I do dove into it a little deeper. Boy, I really love this book. It is a really, really good book. One of, one of the things that's important to note about these spotlights that I do is I'm, I'm not going to spotlight products I don't like. So you're not going to see a spotlight where I'm going to be super critical of something or like, oh, look at this product that came out. It's absolutely terrible. It's not worth my time. It's not worth your time. I'm going to focus on the good things that are out there. So if you see me even spotlight something, there's a reason why I'm spotlighting it. And it's because I like it. Also, I paid for this myself. There is no, I didn't get a free copy of this or anything like this. This is not a, this is not a sponsored, this is not a sponsored segment. I paid my own money. And as for a product I really like, that's the other thing you should know about my spotlights is I do not get paid for them. I will sometimes get a preview of something. Sometimes people will send me a preview of something, but I don't get paid for them and I'm not interested in getting paid for them. I do these because you, you are my customer for this. You are the person I want to help. I want to help you find awesome products because I want to find awesome products and I want to spotlight awesome products. So I don't care about advertising products. I care about finding good ones. So, and this boy, is this a good one? This to me, the, the when I was reading through the introduction, so I, I, I read through the introduction of the book and then I kind of jumped into the book in different places. To give a, a quick a quick summary of, of what this is, it's a 260 page campaign source book. It is a focused adventure. So it's built for like levels one to 13 and it's all set around this ruined city called Drakenheim. Drakenheim was this great big beautiful city and then a meteor or either one or more meteors crashed down and destroyed it. So it is definitely sort of an apocalyptic fantasy RPG. It is definitely dark and filled with like body horror and stuff like that. It has a list of content stuff, violence, murder, blood, gore, cannibalism, body horror, degenerative mutations, physical disfigurements, rat, spiders, insect. It's got a pretty big content warning. I do like that right at the end. It says does not contain sexually explicit material, sexual assault, prejudice, systemic racism, homophobia, or transphobia. Any inferences are wholly unintentional. So it's like, these are the lines, right? These are the lines of it. These are, these are the veils that we have here. These are, these are, these are what is going to be in here. And it's a lot of stuff heavy on the body horror. You'll see in the art and everything like that. So it is what I would say is sort of a dark fantasy, not as dark as like Mjorkberg dark, but definitely a dark fantasy setting. This a ruined city, lots of places to explore. And what really grabbed me when I read this is it's a DM's book 
written by DMs for DMs. It's so clear in how they designed this book that they understand what's hard about dungeon mastering, which is something I think about all the time. I'm always thinking about what are the hard parts of this game and how do we put out products to help people run better games? And it's clear that like they really learned a lot, probably running this particular campaign, but also they have a lot of experience in the kinds of products that are really helpful for DMs to run campaigns. This is not a homage to their love of their story. This is a practical book meant to help you run a campaign in here. And I tell you, if I wasn't, if I already didn't have two of my campaigns planned out already, I would seriously have considered this. And I will seriously consider this. I would definitely run this campaign in the future. I don't know when, but boy, it's really good. The problem that we have is there's so many good ones. There's so many good campaign settings. It's really hard to fit them all in, but this is really strong. So it's set in, and I'll and I'll give I'll give examples of 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 where it sort of helps us out. One one of them that I thought was really great is this idea called the haze, and you know I I read this and I just laughed because it's like ah it's so handy the haze. So you have this city Drakenheim. It got smashed by all of these crazy otherworldly meteors that have destroyed the city and released a bunch of monsters and mutated a bunch of people and stuff like that, which is great. And it has created this sort of fog that sort of goes in different places. So adventure locations, various parts of the city have this multicolored fog called the haze. And when you enter the haze, you cannot fully rest, right? The characters gain no benefit from taking a long rest within the haze. Adventurers should be well rested before they head in and they'll need to, then they'll need to get out before they, they'll need to get out if they want to take another rest. And you, and I love this because like, this is a common problem DMs have. How do I, how do I manage the rest that the characters have? How do I, if they go into a place, how do I stop them? If I, if you didn't think about exactly, there's lots of ways to do it, but there's a lot of times you have to come up with these like weird ham fisted ways that you can't take a rest in a place. And I've definitely done stuff like this before where i've said like in this dungeon the constant whispering of nightmares in the shadows prevent your ability to to get the benefits of a long rest and players like oh right well in this case it's like it's built into the campaign they've built a way into the campaign and they haven't told you where to put it you get to decide so you might say like there's one room in this dungeon where the haze isn't there and you can rest there but it gives this sort of opt-in idea of where characters can take rests instead of coming up with crazy reasons why they're not able to take a rest and it even bypasses things like rope rope trick and tiny hut these are and you you would tell them you would tell them i would definitely bring this up in a session zero i would tell them like this exists in a session zero and, and even spells that create extra dimensional portals are not going to help you get uh, get around the haze so that that to me is like an example of a practical addition it's it's got a it's got an in-world reason why it is there but it's clearly there because these are dms who understand how difficult it is to help manage rests in an adventure and i and i really like that the adventure so it's it's not a very procedural chapter based adventure. It's definitely like you can go and explore different things. You can explore different areas. They they definitely built a city. I love it because they built a city that's just designed for D and D. It's designed for adventure. And a lot of times you'll read like city source books. So you'll read other worlds and you're like, yeah, this is great. Like you you built a city and you built your politics and it's got temples and stuff. Where are characters supposed to go to have fun? Like, where do they adventure? Where are the hooks? And it's like, oh, well, this city sits right aside a beach, so there's really no underground places. And you're like, but we like underground places. That's where dungeons are. That's where that's where adventure takes place. And so I always like think about cities, and I build I build cities this way. I built ruins of the Grendel Root. I built it this way. The city of Arches for my patrons are built this way. We're like, start think about the cities in the same way you would go to a player. And you would say, hey, make sure you build a character who wants to travel with other characters going on adventures. Don't make them like the pacifist sage who hates people and would rather be drinking coffee in a coffee shop. And they're just, you know, they, they don't really want to be here. And there's no real motivation for them to be with the group. Instead, you work with your players to say, your character is here to go on adventures with the other characters, right? That's why they're here. Now, maybe they don't want to, but they have to for some reason. There's some drive, right? There's some reason they have to be there. In the same way we might give that to players, we need to think about it for our campaign worlds, that we need to think about it for our locations. Don't, put, don't build locations that don't have adventures in them. Don't put the characters in the middle of locations where there's nothing to do. 
And sometimes I'll read it. I'll read other products and I'll read like a city and there's like nothing to do there. I have to work. I have to come up with reasons. I have to make things up. I remember like, I think it was Baldur's Gate. Now, now Baldur's Gate in Descent into Avernus actually is a pretty good city of adventure. But I remember sometimes there's like, I would read a whole section about Baldur's Gate and there was nothing about anything you could do there. There was nothing about dungeons. There was nothing about temples. I ended up stealing a bunch of stuff from Baldur's Gate and Baldur's Gate 2, the video games, because they had dungeons underneath. This isn't that way. Drakenheim is a city constructed for adventure constructed by the creators of this for adventure it's broken by natural hazards to create it but it definitely has this like, it's it's just thick with adventure dripping adventure is dripping off the walls everything every every shadowy creature in a corner is something you got to worry about i didn't dig too much into the storyline and everything that's occurring here but i did flip through the book and so the so one thing that i always look for one of the things when i look through this is what's the production quality like and the production quality of both the pdf and the physical book is outstanding it looks really really good if you look at that creepy picture is that is that painting not creepy really creepy stuff but beautiful layout beautiful design Really good looking stuff. I didn't, nothing leapt out at me editorial, edit, editing wise. Nothing leapt out at me that made me kind of question the editing on this. It looks really solid. I didn't, you know, I didn't read the entire book cover to cover with a detailed highlighter kind of highlighting stuff, but everything so far looks, looks really, really good. It definitely evokes that sort of dark fantasy spirit to this. And, and again, just more tools, rumor, rumor tables, random encounters, really good random encounter tables that they have in here. This whole idea of factions, five different factions, and you're kind of interworking with these factions. So you can just go on dungeon delving, or you can have like a bunch of political intrigue going on in the city. Again, really, really handy, really a lot of tools. I, I think of this as like a real good toolbox for running a, for running a campaign. Series of Adventures, here's some of your gory, your gory bits, and it's filled with gory bits, filled with lots of like twisted tentacle people and stuff like that a whole set about making your character different ways that you could build your character different goals that your character can have while they're adventuring again making it easy for players to generate characters that fit the theme of the campaign and that fit the style of the style of adventures that you're going to run i think that really works well key npcs lots of good artwork for that what else this is the whole faction guide i mean the book is just packed with useful stuff the art is just great right really really good looking Full page, beautiful full page art. The Queen's Men. Thieves. It's got a nice little safe haven here. Emberwood Village where the characters can go to just take a breather. Get out of the mist. Take their long rest. It's important. Important for the characters to have a place that they can just go to and relax. So that that's that's very important. More of the crazy tentacle horror that you'll find. What Exploring Drakenheim. It's got some nice city streets maps. When I got the digital version of this, it included things like a player's guide. It included a high resolution versions of Drakenheim's city map that you could like print out on a big format if you wanted. It also has VTT compatible maps, full color battle maps that are included with the digital with the digital set. Again, random encounters, but they do they're doing random encounters the way I like random encounters, which isn't just there's some harpies. It talks about what the harpies are doing. I don't want more than this, right? I don't want, I don't want like, you know, paragraphs and paragraphs of stuff. I want like three sentences. To me, like a two or three sentence encounter is perfect for a random encounter. I really like doing it. And then here's the tables that you can roll on in order to determine the random encounters. And then it's got a bunch of adventures and the adventures can be run sort of linearly. The adventures definitely have level ranges, but they're not, as far as I know, there isn't this like whole really tight overarching storyline. It's more like go, going to different places, checking them out and doing things. So looks, looks really good. I, again, I haven't dove, dove into the adventures themselves very much, but they look like they have everything that I would want in order to run an adventure. Again, really nice, re, you know, really good maps that are in the book, but then full color maps that are in the map pack that are compatible with your VTT. I really dig it. Unfortunately, right now, shipping and handling to the United States is $46 for a $50 book. So it's not very practical to order the physical version. I'm really glad that I got the physical version through the Kickstarter because I know I didn't pay that much when I was when I did the Kickstarter. You can get the PDF version of Dungeons of Drakenheim with the map pack, which is definitely worth doing if you're going to be running it in a VTT for 30 bucks directly from the Ghostfire Gaming website. So that's definitely one way to pick it up. I presume that once they get distribution set in the United States, once they get a partner in the United States who can distribute it, that the shipping and handling for Dungeons of Drakenheim in the United States won't continue to be $46. And I don't, I, I can't, I wouldn't be able to justify spending $46 for shipping and handling for a, for a $50 book. But definitely the PDF alone would be worth, would be worth picking up. It also has lots of like little accessories, a DM screen, dice, dice sets, handout 
out cards, all kinds of things. This is something that Ghostfire is known for. Ghostfire is really able to build a lot of cool accessories for this. So when it becomes more reasonable to pick up this stuff in whatever country you happen to be in, there's definitely lots of accessories here. So apparently they have a Kickstarter for a Sebastian, for Sebastian Crow's Guide to Drakenheim, a player's guide built to help players go through Drakenheim. The Kickstarter for that is launching tomorrow. So I, I'll have a link down in the show notes to the Kickstarter and I'll probably do a Kickstarter spotlight once I know what they're picking up. But I'll tell you, after seeing the quality of Dungeons of Drakenheim, I, I'll definitely back it again. The, the, you know, Ghostfire is already a company where like I've seen the kind of quality products that they put out. I know what they can do. They're up there with like Cobalt Press and Monty Cook Games as one of the one of the publishers of RPG books where I don't have any problem backing what they put out because I know the quality of what they're putting out is really going to be good. So so take a look. Check out Dungeons of Drakenheim. Check out the Kickstarter for the new thing they're putting out. Really, really good product. I really loved it. I really liked what I saw. So now we are going to get into our August 2022 Patreon Q&A. Every month on the Sly Flourish Patreon, I post a thread asking for people to post their questions. Some of the questions I answer here on the show, some of the questions I will put into small videos and things like that. I answer every question every Friday morning on the Patreon. So our first question comes from Ryan. Do you have any tips for adding racial distinctions to generic humanoid NPCs in combat? If I throw three bandits, a tiefling, a dragonborn, and a gnome at my party, I'd rather not burn prep time table time applying all the racial abilities to each but it seems a waste not to have them differentiated somehow maybe a cheat sheet table of reference with a damage resistance or save bonus or ability single use that each race gets yes i would not worry about it i would just use this is one i i i I talk about this a lot use flavor flavor can almost always cover up for mechanics you you can you can describe things and the players will think it's real. They, they buy that it's real. Not everything needs a mechanic. You don't have to make sure that your tiefling and your dragonborn and your gnome NPCs all have tiefling, dragonborn, and gnome traits. You can add them. You can improvise them. And you can kind of just choose what you remember. So to have your dragonborn breathe fire makes sense. To have your tiefling be resistant to fire makes sense. And you can combine the two. The dragonborn goes ahead and breathes fire on the tiefling because the tiefling resists it. You can, you can do stuff like that. But I would just wing it. You don't really have to like write a bunch of stuff down. You don't have to keep a lot of mechanics in mind. You don't want to have like, you can make a cheat sheet. I don't, I don't have one, but a cheat sheet would be a good idea. And actually the dungeon master's guide has a little bit of a cheat sheet where it talks about the different racial, the, the racial differences that character, that NPCs might have. It includes even skeletons and zombies in there. So you could have a little bit, but a lot of times the things just don't matter that much. Their ability changes don't matter that much. Sometimes like I would only worry about the resistances if the resistances come into play. Not a lot of time they're not going to. So it can help you to generally know and and as you as your experience is getting better, you will generally start to remember things like tieflings have resistance to fire or dragonborns can breathe fire and you'll be able to improvise these things as you play. I wouldn't I would hang on loosely. I wouldn't worry too much about trying to build in all of the mechanics for things like this. And you can just do so much with a colorful description. You can describe their weapons differently. You can describe their size differently. You can you could just tweak things a little bit, turn blunt damage into slashing damage or piercing damage into blunt damage. And it changes things up. Describe their weapons differently, describe different traits that they have. And then you can add something like maybe you, you know, you could go ahead and have that halfling rogue NPC who has halfling's luck and he rolls a one. He goes, oh, but he's lucky. He rolls again. So you can do things like that, but just sort of play it by ear. You don't, you don't have to play it real hard. Don't worry about wiring a bunch of mechanics. And in this circumstance, I think a lot of DMs hang on too tight to the mechanics relax you can make it up as you go and then the more experience you have running games the more you're kind of remember how things work the more you can go to that you know the more you can you fall back to that doug p says i like the idea of presenting my players a prophecy but then let the meaning of the prophecy emerge through play what is the lazy dm way of generating a full of a, a prophecy that doesn't result in railroading be vague with your prophecies don't give like real hard specifics about you will definitely pick up the magic sword in this old cave and then use it to defeat the lich king instead be like a great power lies ahead your your journey lies into the depths of shadow where you will find light and you want to do it the same sort of way that like hucksters and and like fortune tellers tell fortunes which is you always be vague enough that the future always will fall out that way but you can be specific you want to be specific enough that they don't realize you're doing it that's really hard to do right if you could do that then you could show money out of people i would be vague and it's kind of funny and the players will probably catch on and be like oh really danger lies ahead thank you so much for that that philosophy 
right? Oh, that's so, that's so good. Oh, really? Darkness, light shines in the darkness. Huh. I guess that could be anything, right? So they'll make fun of it. But generally speaking, generally speaking, the philosophy can be, can be loose. Now, another thing a prophecy can be really good at is pushing secrets and clues. If you have your list of secrets and clues, things you want the characters to pick up, a prophecy, like a vision, is a great way for them to get it. If and you know that you can have them tell a little bit about the world previous, but also tell something like, you know, your 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 nemesis is doing things right your your nemesis the gates of the the gates to the realm of the serpent are are cracking open as you speak you can reveal things that are happening in the world these aren't things that the characters that they are railroading the characters they're things that are going on in the world or will go on in the world regardless of what the characters do and the nice thing is that's not railroading because how the players react to that changes so i think a key to a philosophy is not making the philosophy about the character but about the world I think that, that that can really help. David P. says, I've been slowly building a pitch book for players when we talk about new campaigns. Great idea. I'm adding a pitch for City of Arches, but I'm a little stuck on the inspiration category. My question is, what media other than other anything from poetry to video games inspired you when you were developing the setting, cre- characters, and plot hooks from City of Arches? I would probably say there are two... In two direct influences. One is the cover to the Iron Maiden album Power Slave. I've always loved Iron Maiden covers. I've never been a huge fan of Iron Maiden music. I've listened to it and I, I like me some metal from time to time. But boy, I love their artwork, right? The artwork for Iron Maiden is so Dungeons and Dragons. And the cover for Power Slave is one in particular that always grabs me as, as really, really wild. I just I just love it. And I've actually used it in numerous D&D adventures. I've used this idea in numerous D&D adventures. And this idea of sort of the huge, ominous pyramid, this massive temple with a statue to like a lich. I know it's Eddie right? A statue to a lich sitting upon it was definitely something. I'm actually going to be writing some stuff for City of Arches that's directly based on this, a whole, a whole world of dead temples that used to worship the, the, the lich of the City of Arches. The other is the poem by Percy Shelley called Ozymandias. The poem goes, I met a traveler from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive stamped upon these lifeless things the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed and on the pedestal these words appear my name is ozymandias king of kings look upon my works ye mighty in despair nothing besides remains round the decay of that colossal wreck boundless and bare the lone and level sands stretch far away i love that poem and that poem to me is the seed that got me to write the city of arches i love love the idea of a super powerful being that once ruled over this entire realm who now nobody even knows their name and what's left is this city there's definitely other influences here and there there's definitely other things but also it's kind of like well when you read it what influences you it's not necessarily the influences that i've had when i wrote it a lot of the from software games dark souls all of the dark souls games they definitely played into there the, the most recent dark souls game elden ring definitely i took a lot from elden ring and put it into the city of arches the layers and stuff like that but i would say the cover to power slave by iron maiden and the poem by percy shelley are definitely two major influences for City of Arches. Nate W. says, how do you feel about WotC Adventures typically using milestone advancement instead of XP advancement? That feels like a loaded question. I find XP to be a pain to track and manage. Yeah, so do I. But I also don't like the DM fiat aspect of milestones, where the players don't know when they're leveling up. I, I am a miles. I'm, so, so first of all, we need a little bit of nomenclature because milestones in the Dungeon Master's Guide doesn't actually mean what most people describe it as. Milestone. We, when we think milestone experience, what we're actually talking about are like event-based leveling, where a certain event occurs or a certain thing occurs in the game, and that's what the characters. That's when the characters level. Milestone, according to the Dungeon Master's Guide, means that you give piles of experience points for certain milestones that they accomplish, but you're still using experience points. So. I definitely prefer event-based leveling. I don't want to mess around with experience points. It's just, you know, why do we all want to do an income tax form at the end of the night? I don't, I don't, I think it, I think it, to me, it like, it, it, you know, it, it, it's not the important part of the game, right? I don't, this, you know, I get in the same with like the minutia of combat too. I, I want to worry about the big things. Now, that doesn't mean you, that the characters lose agency over this. Like it, it does mean that they're not like keeping track of it and recognizing where they're going to level, 
But it also, that doesn't mean that they don't have agency of the campaign. And it doesn't mean that you can't move the events to where they are aiming. Matt Colville did a really good video about this, about how you can basically, they're, they're player-driven goals. The DM articulates them. The DM writes them down. But it's the players who are coming up with them. And it's the players who are designing them. And they can change. And you can apply leveling milestones. And you can make it clear, like, once you discover this thing, you guys wanted to go to this temple to figure out where you can pick up the Orb of the Sun. When you pick up the Orb of the Sun, you will hit fourth level. Right. And you can make that like a card and you can show it to them. They were the ones who chose that, but you're the one that's tying the reward to it. So you can move them around. You can say things like if you do any of these three things, you will reach fourth level. If you look at like the quest board in Dragon of Ice Spire Peak, there's leveling associated with the quest. And you can make that clear to the players. Like once you accomplish two of these three quests, you will reach third level. You can make that you can make that explicit. It doesn't mean that they only can do one. It doesn't mean they don't have control over it. It means that, oh, okay, we can do any of these three things. And, and by doing any of these three things, we'll, we'll reach a level. So I know different people have different desires when it comes to experience points. If you love using experience points and your players love using experience points, go with the gods. You do not need my permission to do so. You can enjoy the game in any way you want to you want to enjoy it. I know as a lazy DM, and I've, I've done polls on this, more people are using what they refer to as milestone experience, which is really event-based leveling. More people are using event-based leveling than are using experience points because it's so much easier. And it really, who cares, right? Like, this isn't a video game where you're going to go like farm, you know, metal slimes in order to get to the next level. It's going to be event-based anyway because our, often our adventures are event-based. So I think that uh, for, for most of us, the idea of event-based leveling works really well and I like it. But I don't think that you have to lose agency. I don't think it becomes railroading because it's not any more railroading than your story is railroaded. If your story is railroaded, then the milestone leveling, the, the event-based leveling will be railroaded. But if your story has lots of different options, you still get to drop in uh, where things go. So yeah, so it's not really a DM fiat if you are clarifying to the players where they're going to be able to level. So that's my recommendation. Nate, I hope you, I hope that answers your question. Cassie says, do you have any advice for running zero prep one hour games? I think I have the prep under control. Book of NPCs, monster cards, blank pad of paper, blank pad or map of paper, but not sure about running of it. It will obviously be 90% hack and slash, but what extra stuff should I, the DM, be doing to make the game good? I don't, I think that for a one hour, one hour D&D is really hard. It is really hard to run a good one hour game. The Adventurers League tried this a lot. I talked to Sean Merwin. Sean Merwin, I consider like the king of writing one hour adventures. He wrote dozens of one hour, published dozens of one hour adventures for the Adventurers League. And I talked to him. I have a video where Sean and I talk about running one hour adventures in the show notes. And you can check that out. It was during an episode of the, the DM Deep Dive where we talked about one hour adventures. And it's what ended up happening is the Adventures League moved them to two hours because it's just it's too hard to wrangle players together to get them up and running and doing stuff and get an adventure to happen in an hour is really tight. There's definitely people you can do, but a couple recommendations I'd have for running a one hour game are run with fewer players. In fact, one on one, you can do hour long games. Two, three players, you can do one hour. The minute you get like four or more, it's going to be harder. And anything more than four players, it's going to be really hard to give enough people spotlight time for a one hour game. It's going to be really tough. Run low level games, right? The fewer options the characters have, the fewer things they can do in a round, the easier it'll be for them to get through stuff quicker. So you can lower the scope of your adventure, keep the levels low. Because really, like, try running like a level, you know, a level 11 adventure in an hour, you're, you're going to have a conversation. That's, a, that's as good as you're going to get. I also think when you say about zero prep, I think if you really need to keep a game to an hour, you're going to want to do prep. And my thought is, my, my, my experience is that you're going to want to do prep. And it's because you're going to want to know like what is really going to happen in this hour and how do I make sure it's an hour? If you're just playing it by ear, Thing, you know, this is like, you know, this is that old, that old, I think it was, you know, it's attributed to Mark Twain, but who knows who already said it. Like I, I wrote you a long letter because I didn't have time for a short one. That one, that, that statement fits with this. I, I ran a long adventure because I didn't prep a short one. It's so easy to go long. It's really hard to, to go short. So I think you're going to want to spend some time to really refine down what you plan to run in that hour and know how to get into it, know how to jump in. Because really, you're talking one scene. You're going to be able to do really one, maybe one decent sized scene and one small scene. It's about all you're going to be able to fit in. It's going to be really tough. But I wish you luck in that. And I hope you, I hope you, I, I, I hope it all works out.
My friends, that is it today for the Lazy D&D Talk Show. I want to thank all of the fine people hanging out with me today in Twitch. It's always a great pleasure to hang out with you. I, I, I always, I just adore doing this show. For all of you watching from home, th- from all of you watching on, what do I want to say? For those of you enjoying the show, thank you all so much. You can help me out in four ways. One, you can subscribe to the Sly Flourish newsletter where you get a free adventure PDF, a free adventure generator PDF, and a weekly D&D article sent directly to your email inbox. You can support me directly on Patreon. We get all kinds of access to exclusive products and exclusive adventures, a dedicated Discord channel, a previews of upcoming stuff, all different kinds of things. You can pick up any of my books on the Sly Flourish bookstore, or you can share this video or this podcast with your friends, let them know about it and let the the world enjoy some more of the Lazy Dungeon Master. Thank you all very much. Have a great day. Get out there and play some D&D.